This episode of the podcast is brought to you by New Bloom Labs. If you're frustrated with your testing lab, don't worry. You're not alone. Most cannabis producers are. Whether it's you questioning your lab's potency reports for Delta 8 products, waiting for your certificates of analysis to be ready, or inconsistent reports, or reports that are just hard to understand in general. That's why you need to talk to the team at New Bloom Labs. New Bloom Labs tests plant material for potency monitoring, full panel analysis, and official state compliance testing. They test intermediate manufacturing materials such as crude, isolate, and distillate, and they also test final consumer products, which include edibles, topicals, beverages, cartridges, pre-rolls, and keef. Oh, and did I mention that they always provide next business day turnaround on potency tests? Yeah, that's right. One to two business day turnaround on terpene profiles and screenings for heavy metals, pesticides, residual solvents, and mycotoxins. Give them a call today at 844-TEST-CBD or visit their website at newbloomlabs.com. Superior science, rapid results, New Bloom Labs. Hello, my fellow people of the plant. Kevin Carrillo here, and welcome to another episode of the Cannabinoid Connect podcast. My guest today is Andrew Marlett, General Manager at Farm Labs. What's up, Andrew? Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, I know that we we were supposed to schedule last week, but as we both talked about before we started recording, things get a little hectic in our world, especially with how fast paced the industry is moving right now. So glad we were able to make it work today, man. Yeah, no problem at all. Awesome. So Andrew, uh, before we get started and we talk about Farm Labs, where you're the general manager, um, let's first get a sense of your background. So tell us a little bit about um, your experience working in the cannabis industry, what you know, different hats you've wore, and, uh, and what brought you to your position now at Farm Labs? Sure. Um, cannabis has been a big part of my life, uh, as, as may, with many of us. You know, I got started as a teenager. Um, it, it kind of, uh, I had an awakening. I think I kind of started to really bloom as a person. It really took the edge off the teenage angst, let's say that. Um, you know, and so, but I always pursued it from a why, you know, why, why was it helping me so much, you know, and back then there was almost no information. Um, but I had what there was available. I absorbed every bit of it. And, um, you know, when I first started to go to college, uh, later in life, uh, I was originally going to be a cultural ethnobotanist, uh, the study of ethnogens, the indigenous drug use. I basically wanted to be uh, somewhere between Terrence McKenna and, you know, um, name the anthropologist of, of choice. But, uh, you know, someone turned to me uh, shortly after I began that career path and said, hey, do you want to teach or write? And I said, what do you mean? And so, you know, I, I changed my direction real quick and actually have a degree in art. Um, but, uh, you know, as soon as I got the opportunity to move to Colorado and join the legal industry, uh, I was started as a grammar and within six months I was a, a lab director. Wow. Um, you know, I, I, I already knew more than many of the people that I would run into that people considered experts because it's just, it's literally a daily passion. Um, I get, you know, probably 300 Google alerts a week just on industry articles that I read. And it's, you know, I make friends with anyone I can when I want to know things that they want to keep secret. Right. And I'm good at finding that stuff out because I know a lot of my own. So uh, the last 12 years I've been on the legal side of marijuana and hemp. I've worked as a lab director, uh, you know, the majority of that time. Um, the last five years I've been vertically integrating farmers. Uh, so I can teach anyone to take it from plant material all the way through to final product of any kind. And that's, that's really a passion of mine is seeing the small farmer succeed. Yeah. Well, that's, that's brings, raises some, some good points. And that's what I was going to kind of get to. So as you, you mentioned your early uh, experience with cannabis as a teenager, and then it kind of grew from there. You ended up becoming a, a director of a testing lab for what ten plus years. So, in that time frame of of you building and getting closer to the plant, like in the, on the professional side or on the work side, did it touch different aspects? Like, did were you in the growing and cultivation side first? Then did you get to kind of the lab testing extraction side? Like, what was the journey like and the trajectory? 
uh, I, like I said, I went from my first foray into the industry was as a grammar for three days. And the, I got hired on after three days by the uh, head of the, the head of the extraction lab. And I started doing extraction from there. Um, I was headhunted away from that facility to. Uh, what, what is it? What is a grammar for those that don't know? Oh, what oh, is that? Uh, yeah. Grabbing out concentrates. So okay. it's as low of an entry level job as you can get on the extraction side of the industry. Got you. So, okay. Uh, you, you literally sit there all day and, and gram up three, 400 grams of X product you know, or, you know, package out flour or whatever you're, you, it's, it's day labor essentially. Got you. Okay. So it did start on the extraction side first, and then you quickly worked your way up to being a lab director. Uh, yeah. Of, an, of extraction facilities. Of an extraction uh, facility. Yeah. Okay. And post-processing. So the stages of extraction, you start with, you know, raw plant material, then you're going to extract it using either solventless or solvent of some kind. Uh, whether that's ethanol, CO2, or hydrocarbons, butane, propane, um, and you can do, you know, rosin, so on and so forth. I've, I've run it all. Um, and uh, then after that, you have post-processing, and a lot of those facilities do it themselves. That's your distillations, okay, and isolations, okay. Um, and some people would throw into that because it's necessary for those steps, winterization, which is your uh, removal of the fats and the lipid from the material. Got you. Okay. So that was your start. You're, you're in this uh, extraction space, move your way up, like you said, to director of the extraction lab. And then from there, did you kind of see an opportunity in the lab testing space, which is currently where you're at with farm labs or kind of how did that happen and play out? Um, COVID. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I was opening one of the largest uh, extraction facilities in Southern California, uh, reopening it. And um in that process, you know, we got got everything started to roll and then COVID hit and uh, investors fell apart as they tend to do when there's a catastrophe and it's a startup. Um, so I took my, uh, I've, I had a consulting company the last five years, uh, vertically integrating farmers. And so I thought about going back to that, but you know, with COVID and travel, it didn't make sense. So I returned home to Texas. This is where I was born. And I had worked with farm labs for years. Uh, you know, through multiple states um, and uh, went ahead and submitted my application and they hired me on as a, I started on there again, much like on the extraction side, I started as a sample prep. Uh, and since August, I've uh, been promoted all the way up through multiple stages up to general manager. Wow. So that's, I mean, that just kind of speaks to, you know, your knowledge and skill set of the plant to be to be promoted so quickly in both kind of, you know, different, different areas of the industry. And, and that brings up a, an interesting question. So obviously working in the cannabis space, you're going to encounter a number of challenges, no matter what vertical you're in. Right. So mm -hmm. while of course the lab extraction side had its own set of challenges, what new challenges did you kind of face uh, entering into the lab testing space? Uh, I gained a lot more sympathy for the labs themselves. You know, um, it's kind of the, the standard of wherever you're on, if you're on final products, gummies, edibles, vape cartridges, whatever, you blame the lab when there's a problem. And then when you're on the extraction side, you tend to blame the lab when there's a problem. And when you're on the lab side of it, you really see that it's, uh, it tends to be um, issues like cross-validation. Does every lab test the, uh, the material the same way? You know, are they are they in fact going to get the same numbers between different pieces of equipment, te te sample prep techniques? You take into all the, uh, the the different variables that come into doing the analytical side of it. The numbers don't lie, but how you got to those numbers may be why there's a difference, right? Where are you rounding your zeros? You know, sure. um, all that stuff really matters. Well, and and you know that's that is a good point. I mean, there is two sides of the story, right? Of course. Um, but there is this emerging kind of understanding that there is a lab testing problem, right? And, and there's this concept of, of lab shopping that some people do where they know they're going to get the same high potency results if they go to one place as opposed to another. So like how much of that is happening in the industry and what can lab testing companies do to combat this? So First and foremost, you have to have a QR code on your, your C of A, okay? Um, you need to have some way that isn't a piece of paper that can be altered, manipulated, or handed out on multiple items 
So QR codes are the best way that the industry really has currently um, until we get into systems like metrics like Colorado uses where there's actually seed to final product tracking on every step of it. And you can literally see how that's done. Um, it's really difficult on the hemp side right now. So labs have to have QR codes on their C of A's. I would also say that they need to be ISO accredited, okay? And DEA accredited. And those accreditations are gonna uh, show that you at least have uh, some form of standards that you're following on how you do things. So that brings up a good point also, because you hear that a lot. You, they, these labs make sure that they're ISO certified, ISO certified, but sometimes that word can kind of just get thrown out there in a blanket statement type of way. When you say that they need to be ISO certified, they need to be specifically certified for certain things like pesticides, mycotoxins, right? It's not just a blanket ISO certification. They, they need to be certified for each of those categories in which they're testing for, is that right? Yeah, and, and you need to go to the, their ISO accreditation number on the ISO website and read, see, read and see what accreditations they hold, you know, and when was the last time they were audited? Uh, did they lose their accreditation and they're operating under an old number? You know, these are all things you have to take into account. But, you know, when it comes back to, back to the C of A issue, right? Um, how old is the C of A? I, I don't know how often you hear people say this, but if it's more than a month old, don't, don't believe it. Just don't. I mean, it could, unless it's on a server and there's photos associated with the test so that you can see, yes, it's the same. But even then, distal, it all looks the same, but you can have a 30 point variance in potency. So how do you know that it's the same distal that was submitted? You don't. So then you, then it comes back around to not only do you have to have an ISO accredited lab, but then you have to have checked your lab and audit your lab send them blanks, send them the same sample three or four times and see how what the variance is between it. If it's more than like three to 5%, depending on what the test is, you might want to go to a different lab, you know? And, you know, the one thing I would say though is, you know, Delta eight is, uh, that's a whole other conversation. And so it's a mess to test. Um, and anybody who says they have it hundred percent under control, uh, there's about 15 different ways to make Delta eight. And each one of those ways have, has its own issues when it comes to testing. Right. So. Yeah, we, we touched on this during, uh, in fact, the, the first time I met you was on the uh, recent podcast with uh, Hemp Tours Live. Yeah. And uh, that was part of our discussion topics was Delta 8. And I have that as a discussion topic today that we can dive into. Sure. Um, before we do that, I, I want to wrap up this, this kind of first topic we're, we're discussing, which is, you know, the, the lab testing and, and areas in which they can improve, right? And so another thing that I came across, I talked to um, another expert in the, in the lab testing space out of California, and they mentioned that there's a lot of learnings that we can get from Michigan, because it seems like Michigan regulators are more willing to take feedback from the la the testing labs in the state as opposed to other states that are that are online right now. Have you have you heard anything that that Michigan's doing different than others? The, the, they're actually using the lab uh, testing protocols that they put in place, and then the results and the feedback from the experts running the tests to actually get real information about what they need to know. Legislators, it's unrealistic for the, to them to, for us to expect them to be experts in this industry. Right. We have to educate them, and that means all of us, okay, about the specific facets of what we do and be honest. If you see people doing dirty stuff that, get, that circumvents a rule, you know, snitching on them isn't a bad thing because it protects all of the rest of us. Right, right. And so that in Michigan, they bypassed all of that, and they're going, hey, you know, the labs come in and say, we're seeing this dirty trick, or we're seeing this issue, or we're seeing that this is an unrealistic expectation to put on these facilities, you know, um, and the, and the legislators are taking that into account. And I completely agree with that. Yeah, no, me too. And, you know, even to make it a, a better word, like instead of snitch, it's just holding them accountable. You know what I mean? Like we all have a lot to lose in this industry, right? And regulations coming, whether they want it or not. And so we might as well be doing the right thing and, and setting the standard initially so that we all kind of, you know, succeed in a way, sure. right? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm totally about that. So in, in Texas specifically, you being, you know, again, the GM at a testing lab, have you seen that the regulators here in Texas are open to feedback and education around some of these regulatory issues? 
I think that the individual agencies themselves need to be talked to about individually and that the, the, and then we talk about the politicians, right? The polit we'll start with them. The politicians, it's a, it's a mixed bag, right? A lot of them have seen the benefit that this, you know, hemp-based cannabinoids can give to the family members or themselves. And they're all about it. They just want to make sure that we're doing it safely to protect everybody, including the state, right? Um, I think that the TDA is doing absolutely everything they can with what they have. I think Sid Miller has done an amazing job. Um, you know, uh, how many how many ag professionals do you know that when hemp comes into their industry, they plant their own hemp crop? Right. You know, he got he got down in the dirt and learned it from the ground up because that's what he's expecting these farmers to do. He needed to see what the problems were. Um, I think uh, dishes, DSHS, uh, they're taking a typical amount of time that most, you know, uh, bureaucracies take to learn how to do this. And as they've made adjustments, they're heading in the right direction. Do I think they're there yet? No, but they'll get there. And, you know, it takes every state five to seven years to get it right. It really does. Right. I so. mean, it's so new. I mean, we haven't, we haven't grown this crop at a massive scale, what, since the last hundred years. So right. Um, given the current economic state in which we're at and the technology that's available and whatnot, we really got to make sure that we're, we're doing it right. Yeah. And it's important for both sides of the aisle to be working with each other. And it's encouraging to hear you say that, you know, uh, Sid Miller and other um, policymakers, you know, within these departments are open, you know, to doing that. So, oh, absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. So let's, let's talk now about homogeneity testing, right? Sure. Um, I know that this is something that's not required, I believe, right now when it comes to the lab testing space, but it's super important to ensure that the efficacy of the edible products that you're producing are consistent, right? So with the new FTC ruling that they're actually going after people on label claims in this industry, um, you know, homo homogeneity isn't just, you know, that you've got your entire batch done correctly. It also comes around to the testing side because certain matrices, in other words, what you make your final product out of, say you're making a salve that's high bee beeswax. Uh, there is no lab on the planet that can separate all those cannabinoids back out of that uh, without doing very expensive testing. So that means that if you're going to label 150 milligrams per container, you probably need to adjust by as, as little as 7% over to ensure that you actually can, sh can show on the testing results label claims. Right? Does that make sense? You know, gummy, gummies are like three to 5%. You usually have to go over three to 5% to get consistent testing uh, results that match your label claims. So you're saying, you're saying that lab the label in which the, the amount of milligrams that's in the product, they mm -hmm. sometimes have to increase the amount per serving mm -hmm. to ensure that that matches up with what's on the label. But based on and, it, and the reason for that is, is the individual components that they're making it out of. So if you're making, you know, simple stuff to test a tincture, right? That's a final product. Tinctures are easy to test. You can put in 25 milligrams per serving and it'll come out plus or minus 3% margin of error to 25 milligrams. You start throwing it into gummy material that's harder to break down in the laboratory for the sample prep side. And it, so you'll have this mar a greater margin of error. And, and if you want to match your C of A, your test results, to your label claims, a lot of times you have to raise your overall potency, right? And then on top of that, make sure that you've completely homogenized your batch and then tested your homogeneity every three or four batches to ensure that you, your employees are maintaining production correctly. That process makes sense to me, but it raises just questions out of curiosity. So like, the first is, is that the reason for that issue? Is it because the technology is just not there or literally it's just too hard to break down the compounds from an edible as opposed to like a liquid, like a tincture? Well, the, so yes and no on both. So on one side, uh, on the testing side, uh, when you start mixing in waxes, gums, things like that, uh, sometimes even like chocolate, chocolate is notoriously difficult to, to get exactly correct. If you put exactly 25 milligrams in, in one gram of chocolate, right, you'll probably see 21, 22 uh, milligrams, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you, if you want your label claims to match uh, the potency results of your testing, the FTC doesn't care about margin of error. The lab has a margin of error that they're allowed to work in under ISO. So you as you as a company have to make sure that your label claims match 
the testable amounts, even though you may know that the, there is that amount in there, right? And so, so there's multiple ways that we have to look at this. You have to look at it from the manufacturer, you have to look at it from the lab, and then you have to look at it from the government and how they're regulating it. Because you're saying that the ISO, ISO certification gives a, more, a little more leeway in terms of potency to play around with as opposed to labs that don't have that certification, which is more important for the lab to understand and, and the manufacturer to understand because they know that they have that leeway. Uh, leeway isn't the word I would use, but yes, yeah, you, you're right. I mean, it's, it's the lab has, th they have to show consistent results uh, when they get accredited for ISO, that they're within a certain margin of error, okay? In other words, you're, you know, you have a known quantity, you, you're 25 milligrams, you come back at, you know, 24, you're within margin of error, you pass, right? What if you and, go over? What if you go 26 milligrams or 28? As long as you're still within the margin of error, which goes both directions. Got right? you, okay. okay? So, but then there's the FTC, which is now saying that your label claims have to match testable results, right? Mm -hmm. Not what you put in. Right, right. What can be tested, right? So now manufacturers are being required to, if they want to label 25 milligrams on some things, they have to put in 27, 28, right? To meet those regulations. And because, because there's no margin of error there. There has to. That has to be exact, but they're overcompensating because again, like you said, in edible formulations, the potency is a bit lower than you would get from a tincture. The, the reportable because of the fact that some edibles are just harder to test. Like if you get, you would, the testing time required means that your edible, that's why in some states, edibles cost twice as much to get a potency on. Because in those states, the regulations require that the lab does it differently, right? So. And then it comes back around to, you know, do we charge more for edibles testing or do we tell our clients just, which is the, the cheaper option, up your cannabinoid content a little bit so that it comes in correct, right? Right, now here's my next question. Okay, I'm following you, this is yeah. good. So now is this, could this be problematic when you're trying to adhere to the, um, you know, the, the potency levels for THC, which is 0.3 or less? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I would never advise anybody to make a formulated product with a broad spectrum only, uh, I mean, uh, yeah, full, not full spectrum, but with broad spectrum CBD distillate, okay? In other words, tea free, okay? Right, right. Because you, you, it's, always, it's always problematic and can create problems on your uh, final products, okay? Um, batches might test differently. Maybe the lab made a mistake. You trust their results. You go ahead and formulate out your product. Now you've got something that's at 0.4 THC, you know, whereas if there's no THC in the process, you know, the diff cost difference is negligible when you're talking about thousands of units, when you're talking making tinctures or edibles and things of that nature, which is why most people have just moved straight over to isolates, right? right. Because there's no THC in that at all. Right. You know? Right. No, I, I understand. Yeah, no, that makes sense from a risk management standpoint, like just go with broad spectrum, make sure it's THC free or isolate, right? Just right. make sure that. Um, but I just wonder, like, it's, it's so it's so interesting to me how each state, how they're they're working within the confines of the regulatory framework that's in place, right? You have a play, a state like California, who's been adult use for a number of years now, had a medical program forever. And they're like, you know, you're seeing their consumer market, not all of them, but the majority really focused on high potency products. I want the highest THC level I can get, right? Then you got states like Texas and others that are, are hemp states, right? But there's this fascination with Delta-8 and, and isolate products and broad spectrum because they have to work within those confines. And um, it's interesting and fascinating to me, but I also, I, I, I obviously want full full legalization because as we know and what we've heard from scientists is that you want that entourage effect you know you mm -hmm. want that full spectrum where you're getting all the the minor cannabinoids as opposed to just isolating one or two you know because it's better for your body so um i just kind of want to throw that out there you know but it's just fascinating how we all want the same thing in a way we just have to work with within what we can do you know sure sure but, you know, the entourage effect, you're not going to see a significant increase in uh, the overall uptake of your cannabinoids or terpenes because you have 0.4 THC in there. 
Right. You know? So the, the, from my perspective, the federal government having this, you know, arbitrary delineation between MJ and hemp, which, you know, is silly, right? Sure. Um, but it is. Uh, so no, yeah, for sure it's silly, yeah. Yeah, <clears throat> but from a manufacturer standpoint, from a good business standpoint, really just removing all the THC is the best way to go. And from, the, I completely agree with you on the regulatory side that it should all just be legal. You know, it's, but you know, the interesting thing is something that you said uh, that states like California are just focused on Delta 9 THC potencies. Um, I, I had a friend send me a text message, uh, a dispensary selling, uh, selling cannabis in a legal state in Colorado. It's sprayed D8 uh, MJ. Really? Yes, because- I, they, Go uh, ahead. No, go no, ahead. I'm just saying the overall cannabinoid effect is very different between the two of them. So, you know, combining the two just makes sense to me. You know, I, yeah, I, I totally see that. And that, that brings up like a thing that I need to ask. My next California guest is like, what is the Delta eight market look like there? Like, it, does it even exist? Is it, are there people that are, are, are gravitating toward that? And, and if so, what, what, you know, like, I, I'm just interested to learn more about that. Cause you hear so much about Delta eight in the non-adult use states right now. Right. Cause Everybody, I mean, not everybody, most people want that psychoactive effect, you know? Um, but what your, what your, your last point was, is that um, there, you're saying that Delta 8 and Delta 9 combined, obviously, what did you say about Delta 8 and Delta 9? Sorry, I missed that I'm point. I'm saying they're actually starting, just like they spray hemp flower with Delta 8, they're spraying uh, outdoor, uh, you know, cannabis from Colorado, low quality material. They're adding turfs to the Delta 8 and spraying it, and it's for sale. And people are buying it. That's not good, man. I don't, that's not a good thing, is it? I mean, didn't we talk about on the higher? I don't think uh, it tastes good. I don't think it tastes good. Do I, do I think it's unsafe? Not, not really. As long as it's good D8. There's good D8. Okay. There really there's safe and a, a, there's safe D8 that exists. You know, it tends to be more expensive. Um, but, you know, the, that's the, unfortunately, a lot of the D8 industry is on a race to the bottom from safety and cost. So it's unfortunate. So that's, should you be cautious? Absolutely. But you know, th there is really rock solid good D8. I yeah. Really, yep. And I wouldn't, I can't imagine like that, that I know, I know that there's probably lawsuits going on. The government is some way trying to clamp down on Delta eight, but with all of this momentum happening, um, you know, especially where you hear a Senate majority leader, Chuck Schumer talking about, um, you know, marijuana reform bills as their number one priority. It, it doesn't seem like they would move on clamping down on Delta eight when we're looking at, you know, nationwide legalization in the next, in the next couple of years. Right. I, mean, I agree with you. And all the lawyers that I've seen write articles about Delta eight and Delta 10 specifically have said that they would have to rewrite both of the farm bills that cover hemp with agreement prior to rewriting them. And the, 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 leg, the, Individual states can can legislate it. They can make Delta 8 illegal. And I believe there's a couple of states that are choosing to do so by making all psychoactive chemicals illegal, but they don't understand that that's including a lot of very legal things. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, they, they, it's just, we're in very interesting times, you know, and, and that's what I'm going to say about that, that it's, it's very interesting, who knows where it'll go. Um, but I wouldn't, I, I would be very surprised if Delta eight became illegal yeah. at this point, very surprised. Isn't it fascinating that with human intervention, how complex we can make this plan, <laughs> you know, yeah. like we are humans. We tend to just make everything more complex <laughs> than it needs to be. <laughs> it's a it's a plant that has hundreds of cannabinoids in them and yeah. you know and uh, other secondary camp compounds like flavonoids terpenes and guess what they all do different things but we've decided over the years right to just kind of first call the plant a different thing when you're talking about the cannabinoids being more dominant in one than the other mm -hmm. um and and it's just and then you have federal regulation and local regulation around it. That's just it just fascinates me, man. But you know the the big answer, like we all talk about, is is federal legalization. I don't know if it'll happen right away. I think there'll be some reform first in terms of safe banking. You know, we've talked about dropping that shitty uh, IRS two eighty e provision that doesn't allow you know, cannabis businesses to, to deduct, you know, regular taxes at the end of the year, like any other normal business would, that is just insane to me. Trust um, me, I know. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, firsthand. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So, but, but it is looking positive and there is momentum happening, especially, like I said, with uh, Senate leader, J- uh, Chuck Schumer making some moves there. So now let's talk about, we talked about formulations. Um, let's talk about innovative formulations. I heard this kind of buzzword. Um, I've looked into it. I've had guests on talking about nano emulsion formulation um, because there's been this challenge of mixing, you know, minor cannabinoids like CBD and others into liquids. Right. Mm-hmm. So tell us a little bit about uh, nano emulsion um, formulation technology and, and uh, all, what all that entails. Um, it's, it's an incredibly new technology that is, um, some people have it down pat and it's stable. It'll, it'll, it doesn't separate out once you mix the final product. So you're making a soda. Okay. Uh, that soda could sit there for the lifespan of until it expires and the cannabinoids will stay in solution. Um, other people lose three to five percent of their cannabinoids on the walls of the container because you're taking essentially water soluble oils, right? Like soybean oil, soy le- lecithin, and other things like that, and you're blending in cannabinoids, suspending them in nano sized particles in that oil, right? Mm-hmm. And now you then homogenize the new oil you've created, the blend, into a water or a drink or a watery substance of some kind. Um, oil and water d- don't like to stay together. Right. Right. So it, it, it's its own, uh, just like Delta, it's its own um, very interesting side of the testing game, because, uh, again, everybody wants to blame the lab. Everybody wants it to be our fault. But, you know, we, we only report numbers. And so, you know, but yeah, nano is fascinating. Um, it's has potential. Um, do I think it's. Uh, in its final state of its final evolution, no. Uh, I think that there's enough people out there working on it that there's going to be nano that actually works incredibly well in the next 10 years. And, you know, that'll be pretty amazing. Um, even even better than it does now, you're saying? Or, yeah. or other oh, yeah. ways we can yeah. use it? Other ways we can use it. I, I mean, actually, like, you know, think of uh, uh, just being able to have an inhaler in your pocket that, uh, or a, a um, like those little water flavor bottles, right? Like I bought all the brands that make those little, you know, flavor additives that you drop into your drinks. Uh, imagine having one that had, you know, two grams of a 99% distillate suspended in an oil inside of it. And yeah. all you have to do is put a tiny little drop in your drink and you got, you know, 50 milligrams of cannabinoid of choice um, and meter dosing and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I just think that the, it's not just the technology of water solubility, it's the delivery methods, right? Uh, that right. the technology needs to evolve. Yeah, no, that makes total sense. Like having a little, you know, a little, um, like you said, a little vial or something to where you can you can accurately dose whatever it is, beverage you're consuming or whatever, you know, that, that would be really cool. Um, and, you know, with like, if you had to guess how many beverages on the market now that are hemp infused, um, do not contain nano emulsion formulation and the cannabinoids are sticking to the, to the, the sides well, of the even, can. Even the nano, there's different nano recipes, right? So even the nano will stick. It's not just the not in nano. It's just that it's, um, it, anybody who's made uh, beverages of any kind or used nano for any significant amount of things other than mixing it into another oil can tell you that it's problematic. Nano emulsion, uh, emulsion CBD uh, oils that are like five, 15%, whatever you buy, right? Those in capsules, they're amazing. Uptake on the cannabinoids is, is nearly instant. It's that when you start mixing it into other products, right? And you start to turn it into something else that it becomes difficult to again, meet FTC regulations, have it test correctly in the lab and that, that side of it. It's, I don't even think it's necessarily a problem with, most of the people making it, I think it's that we're just learning, right? I mean, yes. Yeah. It's so new. Yeah, exactly. And there's a lot of people who claim that their lab has nano testing down, but if that was the case, D8, people change their lab more often over D8 issues than anything else. The second thing is water soluble. Every lab, like the, and people constantly go on, go on Reddit, go on future 4200. Those threads are full of complaining about labs 
And it's because that you got a man-made cannabinoid that's made in a whole bunch of different ways that a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, um, catalysts and other things could be carried over in the process. So you don't actually know what all the ingredients are. Is it actually final? Is it finished catalyzing, you know, and the, uh, things like that, you know, um, and then you got the water soluble side where, you know, maybe their batch got cold in the middle of them running it and they didn't get a full emulsion on their final product. And so you get like 300 milligrams in one uh, can and it's supposed to be 10, you know, which I've seen. Um, and so th these are the kind of issues that I'm talking about where there's this constant like ebb and flow of, of learning on every aspect of the industry. It's those, the people making the final product, the people extracting it and f small part, the labs. But again, we're just reporting numbers. Mm -hmm. you know, um, we can come up with new ways to do sample prep, but when it comes down to it, we just, we test it, we report the number. And from me being on the other side of the industry, making products, I can tell you that uh, product formulation and, and getting your homogeneity down and your SOPs is 80 to 90% of the time the problem. It's not the labs. Even a bad lab can give you good results is what my point is. Right. What can labs do? Like, I'm glad you clarified that, you know, this is still new, like nano, nano emulsion and, and us trying to figure out the formulation and making it work the best way it can. Right. And, and ultimately that's up to the, the manufacturers, the people actually producing it. it. But is there any way that the labs could, could help and collaborate as well in terms of maybe um, with equipment or, or technology or what have you? Well, at, at farm labs, we've, spent of money uh, to figure out uh, different testing methodologies for different substrates for nano emulsion. And so we have several different approaches. Some of them take, they don't fall into our 24 to 48 hour turnaround time. They, they take a week and we basically go about testing it in a completely different way that we get rock solid results every time. But again, doesn't always mean that the customer is going to like the numbers they see because nano is very hard to get as a, a good solid product in some products that people are trying to make with it is my point. Right. And, and last point on this, and I, I just got to ask you, cause I'm curious again, no, this is no fault to the manufacturers that the labs, cause again, this is so new, we're trying to dial it in and figure it out trial and error. Yeah. But right now, if you could guess on the market today, like how many beverages actually have successfully mixed with these minor cannabinoids? I, I, Man, uh, I, there was an article recently about it that it was something like 50% of the all products on the market that have CBD uh, content labels. Uh, it, there's little to no detectable CBD. Right. I don't want to talk specifically about nano on that, but I can just say I know for from that research study has shown that it's as much as 50%. Yeah, no, I've heard the same thing. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because, you know, I've had... Uh, other guests on in the lab testing space, one of which who was commissioned by NBC to do a huge major study on, on the products concluded in Amazon. Mm. And 80% of all CBD products in Amazon had no CBD, you know? So it's not just a problem of the technology and the formulations. It's also the problem with the emergence of snake oil and low quality products, you know, emerging in the market as well. Yes. Uh, one of those, if I remember correctly about the Amazon case, a few of those products were just named CBD something. They made no claims of milligrams. And so they were being tested. Yeah. And, and that's, that's just dirty. That's just dirty. Marking, marking up their products probably by like 500 million percent or, you know, 5 million percent or whatever, because they, they would just take regular gummies and upcharge saying they're CBD edibles. It's, yep. it's, it's crazy. So in that aspect, of course, that's where lab test testing can step in and, and kind of stop these bad actors from trying to move these products. But I'm sure that they have their own well-oiled kind of process where they're either, you know, fraudulently making fake COAs or they're just working with shady labs to get these results, right? Yeah, I've seen it all. I've seen Photoshop COAs. I've seen COAs that are a year or two old on product that was supposed to have been made last week. I've seen, I've seen it all, man. It's any dirty trick that any human's done in any sports or money making situation. I've seen it in, in uh, this industry. So, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. What will stop that? Peer, uh, peer review and peer oversight. Um, 
you know, it, it used to be fairly common practice uh, in, in Colorado and other states with on the MJ side of things to uh, before you send your flower out for uh, microbial results, they would dip them in hydrogen peroxide, okay? Because none of them were gonna pass the standards because the standards were uh, too high, right? They were higher than they were for any other food item, okay? Right. In some of these states. And so these guys were che cheating the system, right? And rather than doing it the right way, which is showing the, the, the legislators that you can't possibly pass that, okay? Um, they were gaming it. And that's just one example. I mean, I, like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to teach people how to do bad things. Um, but I can just tell you, I've seen it all. And I've seen a lot of crazy stuff that people do. Right. Yeah, no, I, I in addition to what you're saying, like reaching across the aisle, working with these legislators to educate them around what is, is feasible, right? From a regulatory standpoint, you know, given the lab space or others. Um, hey, are you there? I am sorry. I just got a notification saying my internet was unstable, but um, it was for a second. But you're good. Okay, I'm gonna edit this out. I'll restart. Yeah. Let me just think about where I was going with that. Oh, okay. Three, two. So, in addition to to that, is I would imagine that the FDA consumer oversight would help as well, but there needs to be educating on their side as well. We can't just, you know, leave it up to the FDA to implement perfect regulatory standards um, when, when they themselves may not be as fully educated as, as operators actually in the space. Right. Right. And do you force, to, go ahead. Yeah. No, go I'm ahead. Just say they need to bring in experts. They need to go around and find people that have been in, in all aspects of the industry, bring them together on a council, sit them all down and write the rules that way, not the way the farm bills were written. You know, the farm bills were kind of that, I don't know the whole story, but what I've heard, I'm just, it, it's disappointing. But, you know, yeah, if, if we're gonna actually do this as a nation and legalize uh, all forms of the plant, uh, they need to bring in people from all aspects of the industry. Yeah, and, and we talked earlier about like, you know, some of the immediate reform that that the cannabis industry could really use right now and we didn't really talk about fda do you foresee the fda consumer oversight over cbd products coming anytime soon um i am hoping that the federal government will take the route that colorado did by forming the med uh the med in my opinion while not perfect has done one of the best jobs of any state um, uh, bringing in people from all aspects of both our industry and every other industry or sur surrounding it. They brought in law enforcement professionals to teach them how to handle that side of it. They brought in, you know, farmers, uh, people who've been on the ag side, every aspect and kind of bring together a bunch of think, uh, create a think tank and do their best at responding to the critiques that the community gives and growing as quickly as we can. But I would, strongly recommend anybody getting into this industry to understand that it's going to take regulators minimum 10 years, you know, any state to get it right, get it tolerable in five to seven. And it's just going to take time. What do you, what do you think about the way Oklahoma is doing things? I hear a lot of great stuff. I don't know specific details and whatnot, but is there, I mean, we talked about Michigan earlier. Is there anything that Oklahoma is doing that we could kind of take as a best practice? they're actually vetting the labs. That's why all those labs got shut down recently. Um, you know, and I applaud that. There's a lot of dirty dealings on the lab side of the, of the industry, just like every other aspect of it. Not to focus on the negative, but I'm just saying that, you know, really and truly when Oklahoma did that, they went through and did investigations on every single lab to make sure they were doing what they're supposed to. Um, I, I can't say anything but nice stuff about that. You know, and other people see that as a negative. I really don't. No, I think it's a, I think it's a positive as well. I mean, yeah, there needs to be some type of uh, accountability, like we talked about earlier. This is actually a good segue because it brings up the the topic of cannabis matrix or 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 ways in which we can ensure that the way in which these uh, lab testing facilities are operating um, with cleanliness and, and, you know, making sure that all their equipment is up to date and there's just kind of this consistency. So t tell us uh, your thoughts on, on, you know, the cannabis matrices and, and what labs can do to remain compliant and, and high standard. Um, 
I, th I think there's like two or three questions in that. Um, so I would say that like the, the matrices, uh, the labs themselves need to stay aware of where the industry is going, whatever, you know, that's true of any industry. But uh, I often will see, you know, distillates just labeled uh, as a simple concentrate. And, you know, that, that, and that labs get these crazy numbers. And then when you talk to that lab, they're treating, uh, they're not, accounting for the concentration of cannabinoids to get accurate results. The more concentrated the cannabinoids are, the tends to you want to have a higher dilution, things like that, you know. Um, so I would say that take that into account uh, when you're talking to your labs, like what level of experience do they have in this? Or are they just a food scientist who's just getting into it? Because it's not the same. And um, having industry experts on staff at any lab that you can talk to if they don't have that, that's a red flag, I think, um, because they need to. There needs to be at least one person in there that's going to speak the lingo of the industry, and understand how those different products are used, how they're going to be formulated into new products, and can educate the people because that's what, that alleviates a lot of the confusion that happens. That's what I'll say about that. Um, as far as what labs can do. Um, if your lab isn't allowing full transparency, whether that be tours of the facility, whenever you'd like, you know, of course, if they're super busy, no, but, you know, tours of the facility, at least a couple times a year, um, they, they're not willing to share with you the chromatograms, which are the actual readouts from the equipment. Uh, they're not willing to give you, you know, uh, more in-depth explanations about what the issues you may be having are. Um, consider going with another lab. That kind of transparency is, is an absolute requirement for uh, somebody who's giving you raw data and the facts. And if you go into that, you know, uh, testing facility, uh, third party analytical lab, and they're in a closet in the back of a dorm room, and I've seen this in Colorado, and it doesn't matter if they're licensed or not, that's that just know, you know, take into account the professionalism of the people who are working with your product because you're, you're in, you're, livelihood is on the line. Yeah, no. So that, that makes sense. So I want to recap. So you mentioned, you know, the, the level of knowledge and experience in which the, the team that you're working with at the lab has, right. Making sure that they're professional and they're knowledgeable. And then also you mentioned that transparency factor, right. If there's any slight indication that they're unwilling to share added information or, or anything like that, or they're hiding information, boom, another red flag. Is there anything that they can do on the operational side, like in terms of, I know that, you know, um, you know, cleaning the equipment and making sure that other, you know, um, testing samples don't get contaminated. Like those are other important factors I would assume as well. Yeah, that's regular maintenance of your machinery and also understanding, it goes, goes back around to understanding the, the individual matrices that you're testing. If you run a high beeswax uh, salve through your equipment, you're going to have to do two or three cleaning runs afterwards. You're just going to have to, you know, and otherwise you'll get carryover onto the next test. Um, some uh, some D8 distillates, uh, they require whatever is in that particular formulation of distillate, which is what I'm going to call it, you know, process to produce it, it, it does not want to get out of the machine. And so, you know, you have to do, you have to do some extra cleaning, but this is, these are things that the lab should learn and be able to have an honest conversation with you about it. You know, if you send off your uh, CBD gummies that you didn't have any D8 anywhere near it, and it comes back with a tiny, tiny touch of D8, that's, that's a little bit of a red flag. It's not a major red flag, right? But it's a learning curve for the lab. Now, if they do it again, then it's a problem, right? Mm -hmm. Now, because, you know, there's always those learning curves for the curve for the lab as well. Um, but yeah, regular maintenance on the equipment, ensuring that you're getting consistent results and you're not seeing aberrant minor cannabinoids uh, showing up in your test results because those are red flags as well. Yeah, no, that's that's all sound advice. And, and um, you know, it's important for, for these these lab testing facilities to really take heed into some of these things, because, again, it's only helping to move the industry forward and not not hold us back, you know. And, uh, and so, Andrew, I, I'm really, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your insights uh, in this space. Uh, is there anything, I want to give you the floor, is there anything that you want to leave the audience with before we wrap up? Um, vote uh, and a community activism. If you actually care about the plant, get out there and do something about it. Um, you need to write letters, you need to call your politicians, you need to share your stories. 
2005, I had a traumatic brain injury. Um, I was having grand mal seizures. Uh, CBD saved my life. Um, I've, I've always been a huge fan of the plant, but uh, I wouldn't probably be the same person I am today without it. And uh, I'm happy to share my story with anyone. And I think everybody else should be as well, even if it's just that it helps your grandma with her arthritis, because it makes everybody's lives that, that need the plant. Not everybody needs the plant, but the people who do, uh, we don't know the science of why yet, but some of us just need the plant and it makes our lives better, not worse. It's a benefit. Um, and that's, that's all I have to say, you know, it's, it had nothing to do with the lab. It's just get out there and vote, advocate for yourself and the community. Yeah, no, that's, that's well said. It's good. It's really uh, good to leave with that. And, and you made a good point. There's, there's people that need the plant. Um, if you don't want to be around the plant and you don't need the plant yourself, it's important that you educate yourself about the benefits of the plant, because if not, and you continue to fight this, uh, this battle that you eventually lose, you're depriving people of that plant medicine, you know, and it's only prolonging this process. So, um, Andrew, thank you again so much, man. Where can people find farm labs and your social media channels or websites? Sure. Uh, Farm Labs Texas uh, on any social media platform. Um, most active on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn as well. It's Andrew Marlat. Uh, just search my name, Farm Labs Texas. Um, and yeah, that's about it. Awesome. Well, hey, had fun talking with you today. You really educated me in a lot of these different areas. And I know that our audience got a lot out of it too. So thank you, Andrew. And I, I want to have you back on again real soon, man. Yeah, I'm open anytime. Perfect. Thank you. And thanks for listening, guys. Thanks for having me. Bye.